What's up, folks? Welcome to the Real Estate Leadership Roundtable podcast. I'm Phil Duke Jr., and this podcast is specifically designed for those who are wanting to run and grow and scale their real estate team or their brokerage. Speaking of growing your real estate team, I just got done creating a totally free course on how to easily add three to five agents per month to your team or to your brokerage. There are no sales pitches. There is no coaching program to buy. There is no upsell inside there, just totally free content uh, that I've used to run and grow and scale my team. And we added 96 agents in the last 12 months uh, to my personal real estate team uh, across the country. Uh, To check out that course, just go to freedom-builders.net. Again, totally free real estate course, how to easily recruit three to five agents per month at freedom-builders.net. Looking forward to this great episode today. Let's go ahead and dive on in. All right, guys, we're live today. I'm here with a a great leader who I know uh, everybody's going to learn a lot from. I've been wanting to connect with her for a a while. We met at a a mastermind event uh, that our friend Grant Wise was putting on, and we kind of connected there, and and then we kind of got back to the real world and got busy, right? So, um, but, but Susan Hilton is here with us today. Um, she runs a Century 21 brokerage. She's been with Century 21, um, not just as a broker, but she's been in a variety of roles. We'll get into that in a minute, but she's been with them for 30 years. Um, today, she runs uh, a, a very large brokerage with 83 sales agents. There is uh, other brokerages in her area that maybe have more agents, but she's got more sales volume, and that's something that she is very proud of. And so, uh, she's a non-producer. Um, she's gone from producing to being totally in a non-producing kind of role. And, and and I have some questions about how she did that and what that looks like. But Susan, thanks for, for hopping on here with us today. Thanks for having me, Phil. Appreciate yeah. it. So kind of, uh, you know, rewind the clock for us a little bit. Um, you know, you obviously been in the business for a really long time. You've been in a variety of roles. How did you kind of get to to where you're at today as far as uh, owning and running, you know, one of the largest brokerages in your MLS area. Well, it, you know, everybody talks about what, how'd you get into real estate? Well, I was supposed to be an elementary school teacher and did that for just a very short time and hated it and called my dad and said, dad, I'm really a salesperson. I'm going to either sell houses or cars. And he said, you don't know anything about cars. <laughs> so I got my real estate license right out of college and have been in the real estate industry all since then. Real estate's been crazy, hasn't it? Yeah, it really has. Just in the last couple of years, yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's been real crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I went through the horrible foreclosures, interest rates at 18%, the good, the bad, the ugly. I think we've seen it all. Yeah, we really have. And, uh, you know, I think that the, the, the Interesting thing to think about, though, is that you've you've gone through some major changes in in the real estate industry. Um, you know, I know the the broker that I worked for when I first got in the business. Um, she still talks today about how the MLS went from the book to being online, and how everybody thought that you know the MLS being online was going to you know hurt the, the the industry. And right at one, at one time, people thought buyers agents were going to totally you know wipe out the industry, and then the whole internet.com thing. So you've kind of been through, you know, some of that uh, with all that, Uh, you know, what, where do you think though, you know, you've seen a lot, you've been in a lot of different roles. Um, I'll get you to kind of go through those in just a minute, but you know, what, what are, what do you think agents today should be worried about or not worried about? I think people that provide exceptional customer service and that are honest and do their job, they will always have a spot. Um, We didn't get rid of, most everybody's doing their mortgage application online now. We still have loan officers. Mm-hmm. People need people. And the we find that almost all of our business comes from repeat and referral business. Um, the people that we work with love to send more people to work with us. Mm-hmm. So that's the key with all of this is that repeat and referral business, making sure you're taking care of the people that are in your lives and people want to, they want to help us do better. Yeah. So what are some things then when it comes to taking care of, of clients? Because I agree. What are some things that you think, you know, um, have helped you and your agents that maybe have helped, 
you know, separate you from from the rest? Because there's there's a lot of agents out there and and buyers and sellers have a lot of choices and and, you know, some agents do a better job than others. So what are, what are some things that you would say uh, are some things that agents could do to try to stand out in a in a crazy, cluttered kind of marketing environment that we're in today? Um, we work very strong with our database. We are uh, we follow the, the Brian Buffini, and most all of our agents have been through Brian Buffini's training and really subscribe to that method of relationship building. Um, we're we're the real estate experts for our clients. We provide value. We provide market updates. We we keep them updated. People go to their doctor once a year. They go to see their attorney if they have issues. They get information about from their stockbroker. We provide that information for our clients so they know what's happening with their investment. And we keep in touch on a regular basis. Yeah. Big well, into picking up the phone and having a real honest conversation. Yeah. I, I, I love that. It's actually... Um, you know, the, the market has been crazy. You mentioned it. it's been crazy the last couple of years and and people want to know what the markets do and people love talking about real estate. And I think sometimes as as real estate professionals, we we feel like we're bothering people by letting them know, you know, hey, here's the last three houses that sold in your neighborhood and here's what they sold for. And, you know, I know you're probably not looking to make a move, but this is what the market's doing in your neighborhood. Just just you giving them that information might be what gets you in the door, right? That's right. I, I'm not interested in selling the stock I have today, but I sure appreciate knowing what it's worth. And right. it's, I, I believe that people want to know. And with everything that's changed in the last two years, people don't always know what their properties are worth. And it's never a call to solicit somebody's listing to try to get them to move. I believe that people will tell you when they're ready to move. Yeah. Yeah. I agree a hundred percent too. And I, I don't think I've ever walked into a house that I was showing to somebody and said something that made them want to buy it when they didn't already <laughs> want to buy it. You know, they just. No, no just, our job is to, is to coach and, and we have such great experience and how do we get them through the transaction? But I don't sell someone a house. Yeah. They decide if they want to buy or sell. That's right. And we're just the guide to help them get it once they've decided that's the one. That as painlessly as possible. Yeah. I love it. So I love uh, love that whole outlook on the business. It's it's one that has helped me as well. Uh, let's kind of fast forward to, you know, you've, you've had a lot of different roles throughout your career. You can share as much about that as you want to. But how, how did you get in your current role today uh, of being uh, in charge of the most successful uh, brokerage in your area when it comes to sales volume. How did how did all that happen? And you know what kind of led you to uh, you know being able to take over in that capacity? So about thirty years ago, um, we were I was pregnant with our first child, and we had the opportunity to move to Bryan College Station. I'd been selling real estate in Houston and had been working um, teaching real estate classes. I I believe that the people who teach the classes learn the most. So I'm, I'll volunteer to teach something if I'm not the expert at it, because I believe that I'll go and learn the most and make sure we get the right information out. But we moved to Bryan College Station. Um, I started working with Mike Beal. Mike Beal's family has been in real estate and the Beal organization has been around for over 70 years. So I stepped in, started helping with training and education of the agents and the office started to grow. And over the, all of those years, Mike Beal and I worked together um, side by side. And when he got ready to retire, he offered me the, the opportunity to step in and purchase. Um, the Beal name is very well known in Bryan College Station and Mike Beal is the absolute jewel of a man. So um, we kept our agents when we made the transition. Um, and we, I believe that my job is to do everything I can to help all of our agents achieve their goals, whatever they are. And as long as I'm moving them forward for that, we are a success. Yeah. So when it came to you, because uh, you've been the, literally the same company, you just kind of changed hands, right, for your yeah. entire career. 
which like never ever hardly happens in the real estate business. Right. You know, agents agents make moves all the time, and and sometimes it's a good move, and sometimes it, it's not. Sometimes we just get stagnant and we see people move. Uh, but you know, uh, as you made that transition, um, you know, were there any uh, speed bumps uh, along the way? Any road road uh, road bumps along the way? that kind of uh, were difficult or was it just, Hey, we, we already know Susan, we, we know her, like her, trust her. And, and it was a real seamless kind of thing. What have been some of the biggest, uh, you know, transition things that you've had to deal with, with swapping over the role you're in now? Well, two months after I bought the office, um, Century 21 decided to rebrand everything. And that was quite exciting. Mm -hmm. um, great new colors, great new logo, but that also meant all new everything. So that was just a small little bump along the way. But the, I think the biggest hurdle and the biggest thing to overcome is when you move from running it to actually owning it, your whole mindset changes. Mm -hmm. um, I now have all these agents that I have a moral and financial obligation to. Um, I believe that it is my job to make sure that the company is profitable so they have a place to work. I, we have staff now that we are responsible for. And it changes when it's your money and your name on the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree 100 percent. Yeah, it's a, it's a big burden at times to, mm -hmm. to know going into these sales meetings and and these behind the scenes admin meetings that people don't really get to see that. We're making big, big decisions sometimes that are going to impact, you know, a, a lot of families. And yes. so, um, so you you took it over. Uh, I think uh, I think you told me they were somewhere in the around sixty agents when mm -hmm. you took it over. You're now at eighty three agents today. So not only have you taken over and been able to to maintain what what was previously there, you've been able to grow it. You know, what do you think has been some of the, the keys or, or the, the ingredients to you you getting to the level that you're at today? Because there's a lot of noise out there in the marketplace. There's a lot of different brokerages, franchise, independent, virtual even uh, that are out there competing for for agents in your area. Why, why do you think people continue choosing you and your office over and over and over? Well, we never stop learning. We mm -hmm. always are making sure that we are at least even or slightly ahead of what the rest of the market is doing. Um, but it also comes down to agents want relationships. They want to know that if there's a problem, they can actually pick up the phone and get a hold of me. My mm -hmm. phone's available. They're, they're all on my phone like family. Um, they are never alone. There's never a problem that they hope that, that they can find somebody or they have to call an 800 number and, Hope somebody answers your question. Their, my relationship with them is like their relationship with their clients. I am here to provide value and service. And most of our referrals and the way we grow is from agent referrals. Hmm. That's, you know, it's crazy to, to think it might be that easy. But, you know, so many agents are focusing on, you know, touching strangers and interacting mm -hmm. with strangers and, and working these online leads when when really the barrier to get those people to to commit to them as an agent is at an all time high because they just see you as a salesperson. Uh, interesting to hear that that you've kind of tapped into that as well, not just on the the sales side of things, but also on the recruiting side of things. So are these are these agents that your agents have done deals with? Are these are these agents that are getting into the business and they will look for existing agents? Yeah, a little bit of both. Um, okay. You know, people want to do business with people they know, like, and trust. Yeah. So if somebody's getting get into the business and they like the agent that they knew, they really don't want to be alone. They want to mm -hmm. join a firm that's stable, that's got somebody that will support them. I've got the best agents and I've also got the best support staff. Yeah. So you're never on your own and by yourself. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what that support staff looks like with a with a sales staff of 83 uh, licensed agents? 
what does a admin support staff look like in your office? We don't run very deep um, very, or very many. Um, I have a part-time trainer who is, her job is to help make sure that everybody knows how to use contracts or whatever the, the technical side of the business is. She does a little bit of deal doctoring for our newer agents. All of our old people come to me. Then we have a um, office admin, um, front desk person, and she takes care of all kinds of computer thing. We call her the tech kid. So she makes sure that all of our stuff runs because I don't believe an agent should spend their time working on getting their computer issue resolved. They make way more money if they'll go out and sell houses. Mm -hmm. So we have that. I also have the number one best office manager in the world, Natalie Hall. We have um, a person that helps with agent development. And then we also, one of the new hires this year was we hired a um, director of happiness. So I have the tendency to put my head down and work and sometimes don't notice when things need to be fluffed around the office or um, my, my bill used to say, I, I talk boy that I'm, I'm focused, I'm driven, and I work. Sometimes I miss the nice parts, the niceties. So our director of happiness, that is her job. She works part-time, comes in. She addresses all of my thank you notes, all of my note cards. She gets everything ready so and makes sure the office looks beautiful so that I can do what I do best. And that's help agents achieve their goals. That's awesome. That's, uh, I, you know, I do, get to do a lot of these interviews. I've never heard of a director of happiness. So uh, what does it look like for that person? I, I'm interested to know, like, is that a, is that a full-time thing? Is that a part-time thing? What, what did that look like and how did yeah. you find that person? She works um, between 20 and 30 hours a week. She helps me with any special projects or whatever, but she also makes sure that where our parties, parties and events are planned, that we actually have food there and that Susan doesn't just order pizza. Um, we, she is my number one person of keeping up with communication and correspondence. I send hundreds and hundreds of personal notes and having somebody that keeps my birthday list straight and keeps the anniversary list straight and brings me 10 to 15 cards every day to write those notes. Um, it's easy for me to send a quick text message and tell her that I need to send a card to Bob or Mary or, or a baby gift or whatever. And she makes sure that all of that runs and I'm not spending my time hunting for something. She just takes care of it for me. Yeah. You need a director of happiness. Yeah. I, I'm, I, yeah. My wheels are spinning over here thinking about that. I actually have somebody that might be actually be good at that job. Yeah. Because I'm I'm very similar. I'm very focused. I'm a very analytical person, and and you know at times I can seem like boring and stale. Yes. It's not that I don't like having fun. It's that I'm so task oriented that sometimes right. I, I I just I can't have fun until I get whatever I've got you know going uh, you know done for me. Um, so Bill, you're gonna you know that we're all so different, and some some agents they don't want to talk to me except when I'm talking about a real estate deal, and mm -hmm. then. Some other people that I know and in my personal life as well as business, they want to have conversations. Well, mm -hmm. I have found that if you keep lists of everything, you have a less of a chance that you'll miss something. I'm terrible at remembering birthdays and holidays, and but I have a director of happiness who helps make sure I stay on track and with those as well. Yeah. That's great. That's a, that's a great idea. Deal. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, cause I, that's something that I really, really struggle with. I'm, I'm the, the expert you want to come to when you're having uh, an issue, uh, a problem that needs to be solved. Uh, I'm not always the person that, you know, you, you might want to invite to your birthday party. You know? <laughs> so, you know, uh, you know, some of that though is just, you know, I have a hard time too, kind of, um, you know, crossing that line of, mm -hmm of being a friend versus being somebody's broker, somebody's supervisor, you know, it's just kind of different in real estate too. Um, so let me ask you this. You you run a big real estate company. You've got a bunch of agents. You've got a, a, a pretty good size admin staff. What does a typical day kind of look like for you? Like, uh, you know, what time do you get started? Um, what does it look like when you're at the office? Uh, what does it look like as far as getting done for the day, after hours, weekends? 
What does it kind of look like? Uh, if I were to follow you around, what would I kind of see? Lots and lots of meetings and agent coaching. I okay. spend a great deal of my day with the agents who are depending on me. Um, my day starts really early. Um, and usually by eight o'clock or 8.15, I'm at the office and email's already done. The day's planned. We have staff meeting early. Everybody logs in and, and determines what their three biggest things are that they will accomplish that day. And mm -hmm. then the day gets cracking. I mean, it's, it's some phone outbound calls, lots and lots of meetings, lots of meetings. But it's with agents who need help, agents who want to grow and develop. I still do some training. Um, I have a mastermind group that meets every Monday and agents can bring anything they want to the table except deal doctoring. We're not going to work on the deals. We're going to work on the people. Yeah. And we, we take care of the deals the rest of the time. But that particular time is on goal setting, issues you want to work on. Last Monday was why don't we do the things that we know we need to do to hit the goals that we set for ourselves. And what we find it's, we get in our own way. Yeah, it's us. absolutely. Yeah, we, we sabotage ourselves yeah. more than anything else. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of frustrating at times. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, these these meetings you have are these um are these pre planned meetings? Yes. Are these one on one meetings? Are these group meetings? How how have you found works best for you? It's a little bit of both. Um, with the with lower or newer agents, they do. I believe they do much better in a group. Small groups where they can actually see that they're not the only one that doesn't understand how to make something happen. Um, mm -hmm. The top agents, I spend one-on-one -on -one time whenever is needed or I'm on the phone reaching out to them as well. Yeah. So you, you uh, I've heard you mention this a couple of times um, and I wanted to make sure that the folks watching this or listening to this, you know, here, I think it's an important thing that I think you do uh is that you actually reach out to them you don't just yes. wait for them to call you when they have a problem right yeah and, and the life is so much better if i'm making the outbound calls i know when my agents are going on vacation or when they're going to need some help um maybe uh, experienced agents leaving town and needs a newer agent to go and help with a listing appointment or help showing property we don't have we only have one official team otherwise we kind of call them buddy agents agents that work together and they all pull together but they have found that their business is better when it's not on a team basis mm -hmm. it, it is because it is one-on-one -on -one with the client now they work together they do stuff together all the time mm -hmm. and they have small maybe pods which is how some people would describe it um, our newer agents hold a lot of open houses for the experienced agents. They show a lot of property for the experienced agents, but we're working on them building their database and their clientele. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I, I think one of the big mistakes we can make as leaders is, uh, is just sitting back and waiting for the phone to ring. And that's, uh, to me, that creates anxiety. Like I don't, I don't, I don't want to just wait for this phone to ring uh, just when there's a problem, I, I would much rather reach out to an agent before there's a problem or, or find out about that problem before it escalates and turns into a huge problem. So I, I would, I would say, you know, a common thing that I've heard in, in interviewing, uh, people who have bigger brokerages, you know, 50 plus agents like what you have, um, you know, that seems to be a common theme as well is, is intentionally reaching out to these folks. Um, it may just be congratulating them on, on a listing they got or, a closing they had or just checking, Hey, I hadn't seen you at the office in a little while. Is everything okay? Uh, I think we sometimes forget uh, in this crazy real estate world today where it's technology and leads and funnels and webinars and podcasts and just always stuff new that like simple stuff like that can really, really go uh, a long way. And, and I know one reason why you have time to do that is, uh, is that you, you're, you're a non-producer. Um, yes. can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? I think that's a really important thing. Me and you were talking before we we hit record. I've been out of production for a couple of years. Um, you, you have been uh, as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about that transition? And, uh, and, and well, the transition, it was really easy for me because when I came up to work with Mike Beal, I didn't go back into production. Um, mm -hmm. I came in, in a, as 
sort of a staff type, you know, production, non-producing um, member of the team. But I don't know how real big companies or um, even, I don't know how people do it. I don't know how I can take the information that an agent confides in me about a file, about things that are happening in their life, and then also compete with them in sales. It doesn't work for me. So my 100% focus is on them achieving their goals. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, we see it a lot too. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, you have a team leader or a broker who is the the top producer of the team or the top producer of the brokerage. Um, I would say, you know, I, I guess just different people have different capacities. I, I, I didn't feel like I could do it either. I felt like, you know, when, once we got to like eight or 10 agents, I really had to like, I was at a crossroads. Am I going to be a producer who just has a broker's license or am I going to really be, you know, the broker and the leader that these agents need, which is ultimately going to, you know, result in me growing my company even more. And, and, and I, I took the path of getting out of production as well and, and just couldn't imagine, you know, um, still having to attend inspections and, uh, you know, closings. And, and I mean, we feel in we need to um, sure. still do all those things. I might go help an agent price a property here or there, but uh, not competing against them. It's their listing. It's it's their appointment. And uh, and I think just the whole new world kind of opens up to you, you know, at that point. So uh, kind, kind of last thing, uh, I feel like we could go for a, a lot longer uh, if we needed to here. Maybe we can do an episode two. Uh, down the road is there uh are, are there any other uh business ventures out there that that you are are also associated with do you do any rental properties do you have another business or is it just real estate for you 99 percent of my day is real estate yes yeah 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 and i have it. found that i can have a relatively balanced life i have i have a fabulous husband two fabulous grown kids um Real estate has enabled me to have that lifestyle, and but I also work a lot. And yeah. you ask what my hobby is, I work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's what we do. We love it. Um, I never mind getting a phone call from an agent with with questions. We text, we call, we have group meetings. We have that's what we do, and we love that. But also, our agents love spending time with their clients. It kind mm -hmm. of all. We, yeah. we mirror what and show what examples of what we want others to be like. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Everything, everything that she said for those that are watching and listening, like this is a, this is a, a high functioning leader who actually practices what they preach. I mean, you know, we, we met at an event in, in uh, Northwest Arkansas in the middle of winter to try to figure out better ways to to lead Jen and and to recruit and grow our businesses, right? I mean, like she invests time, money, energy into trying to make sure she's at the at the forefront. And I think a big thing to take away from from this interview with with Susan here is that, uh, and she said it. One of the first things she said on here was that if you provide enough value, you don't have anything to worry about. That's right. And and, and you can hear in what she's talking about here and how she's able to provide a lot of value to her, her agents, to the people that are part of their company, their clients, um, every step of the way. Um, and, uh, you know, regardless of what brokerage you're a part of, what team you're a part of, if you are the kind of leader that provides value, you're going to win no matter what, no matter what the market does, no matter what technology does, uh, you're, you're going to win. So I uh, appreciate you hopping on here, Susan. If you've, uh, if somebody would like to reach out to you, has any questions about anything that you shared about on here, what would be the best way for them to reach out to you? Um, our office is 979-764-2100. All right. Well, thank you so much. I learned a ton. Thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your knowledge. And maybe we can get a, a episode two at some point down the road. Anytime, Phil. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Susan. Bye-bye.